in the next 20 minutes, I, I want to talk about a couple of things. The title is, is digital disruption necessary? And I like to answer that by saying, well, only if you want to survive or thrive. Uh, and so what I want to do is break this talk into a couple of big pieces. One, I want to give you some examples in the United States, uh, four different companies, talk a little bit about what is the power of digital disruption and why it might matter. Uh, second, I want to talk about, well, what is digital disruption? I'm going to give you a real brief introduction to some five powerful software technologies. And then I want to talk about not how all of this might matter to a country like the United States, but how does it matter to countries which may have similar challenges to Guatemala? So I'm going to talk about Kenya, I'm going to talk about India, I'm going to talk about Vietnam. And at the end, I want to leave you all who are listening to this with five big challenges and challenges that I think could lead to a better Guatemala, to a, I'll use the phrase, a digital Guatemala. And then at the end, I'll explain why it is my kids are fluent in Spanish, but my wife and I aren't. Uh, so let me start with, with digital disruption. I, I don't think it's any big secret. This has been going on for quite some time, but I want to put some numbers around this. Uh, Monica's from the School of Economics. So I'm going to put some economic numbers around this. And I'm going to talk about four, four pairs of companies. So let's start by talking about Verizon and Zoom. So Verizon is one of the largest telecommunication companies in the United States. Zoom, as we've heard many times, has been a very fast growing company, particularly in the era of COVID. What you probably don't know or not thought about is Verizon has 10 times the revenue of Zoom, 10 times revenue of Zoom, but it's only two and a half times more valuable measured by its market cap. So 10 times the revenue, but only two and a half times more valuable, which means if Zoom were to grow two and a half times more, well, they'd be worth as much as one of the largest telecommunications companies in the world. So we'll leave telecommunications behind and let's talk about McDonald's and DoorDash. Uh, DoorDash, some of you may never have heard of, but is a company which just recently went public delivering food and obviously delivering a lot of fast food or food from, you know, smaller restaurants. McDonald's, you all know who that is, right? The world's largest restaurant. What you probably don't know is while McDonald's has 10 times the revenue of DoorDash, it's only three times more valuable. So even though it's 10 times the size, it's only three times the value. Let's go to financial services, Wells Fargo. Again, a top five bank in the United States um, as compared to Stripe. You may not have heard of Stripe, but Stripe is a payment processing company, uh, a company founded actually less than 10 years ago. Uh, today, Wells has 150 times the revenue of Stripe, but it's only worth four times as much. And then the example you probably are all thinking in your head is Walmart and Amazon. Walmart, one of the world's largest retailers, is two times the revenue of Amazon at this point in time, but only a fifth as valuable. So Amazon's long gone past them from a market valuation point of view. Now, I know in all these cases, they're not direct comparisons. Amazon does much more than just retail. Uh, you know, DoorDash doesn't sell hamburgers or they don't make hamburgers. But I think I want to make the point that these new digital companies, companies that were born in the digital world, are the ones that have exceedingly more valuable than the ones in the traditional world. So what are they built on? These digital companies are not built on you know, wood and lumber and steel and bricks. They are built on top of software. They're fundamentally built on five core technologies that I just want to say for you to hear the words. Maybe you can go do some research and learning. So the five big things I'll say are number one, cloud computing. Cloud computing sits at the core of everything that's happened. It started maybe 20 years ago by having applications being delivered as cloud services. Amazon entered about 15 years ago, providing compute and storage and fundamentally has shifted how people build software in the modern era. 
cloud computing, number one. Number two, 5G. 5G is just the next step in what has really revolutionized everything, which is communications technology. The fact that we're talking today is, is testimony to how much communications technology has changed things. 5G is greater density, higher speeds, lower latency, which will also enable new classes of applications, including those that touch things. There are about 600 billion things in the world today. That's literally 100 times the population of the world. And as we connect these things, whether that's agricultural equipment, uh, ultrasounds, uh, cars, it's going to change what it means to make these things, make these machines, as well as what it means to use them. Fourth, edge computing. The edge is just a manifestation of what we have seen over and over again in tech, meaning that as computers get cheaper and cheaper, we move them further and further away from the center. And so edge computing, you already, by the fact that you're probably holding a cell phone in your hand or holding an edge computer, you're going to start to see more and more high-performance computing at a low cost, right? further and further out in the network. And finally, all of this, the ability to connect things, the ability to compute is leading to advances in artificial intelligence. The area I would tell you to go spend time is learn about neural networks. Neural networks are the fundamental technology which sitting behind why Google Translate works so well, why facial recognition works so well, and it is born of the idea that if I can accumulate more data with more compute, I can get increasing levels of accuracy, whether that means accuracy in translating English into Spanish or Spanish into English or accuracy in terms of recognizing pneumonia. So these are all cool technologies. They sit at the core of all the advancements, the you know, digital disruptors that we've seen to date in the United States, but I think when you come to Guatemala, and I did a little bit of, I'm a, I try to be a good student, did a little bit of, of uh, research about Guatemala, you realize, well, Guatemala, like 40% of the population doesn't have a bank account. It has one of the lowest literacy rates in Central America. It has half the doctor to citizen ratio that WHO recommends. So maybe conversations about what's going on in America. Yeah, okay, fine. It's good to tell you these stories. But maybe let's talk about other countries which don't enjoy all the things we have in the U.S. So I'm going to start by talking about Kenya. Kenya, I don't know if you guys know this, but actually, oh, now it's probably been five, eight years ago. They moved to a total digital currency. Go read on M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a digital currency born of the fact that they work with the cell phone companies, et cetera. Today, 50% of Kenya's GDP is processed through M-Pesa. Not hard cash, not hard currency, digital currency. And by the way, 93% of Kenyans have bank accounts, have mobile payment systems. But it's not just limited to, a you know, let's call it a small country in Africa, uh, India, I would counsel you also to be a student on this. Actually, I experienced this. In 2016, uh, Modi basically decided, hey, you know, we're not going to have this much hard currency around. We're going digital. It was very disruptive, by the way, at the time, including when I was there. It was like, I didn't know how you got a taxi cab if you didn't have hard currency. But their move to digital, to a digital currency, has been meteoric. Uh, just to give you a stat, there's a government payment processor who processed 100,000 transactions before this currency shift. Uh, one year later, 76 million transactions processed per month. But I don't want to make this just about banking or about currency. I'm going to talk a little bit about Vietnam. Tell you a quick story. I went to Vietnam actually to uh, do a kickoff for uh, a book that I wrote, which got translated into Vietnamese. 
uh, I was invited on the day after I arrived to have lunch with the mayor of Hanoi, who at that point in time, I actually didn't realize how important he was. Uh, we had this nice lunch. At the end of it, I told him, I said, hey, you know, if, if I was you, these are the three things I would do in Vietnam. And so, you know, we had the nice lunch, shook hands, left. On the way out, uh, my uh, host said, hey, you know, uh, he'd, he'd like, they'd like to do something nice for you. I said, well, w what does that mean? They said, well, we, we uh, need your passport. I said, are you, am I getting it back? He said, well, yeah, trust us. I said, okay. So the next day, uh, I come down from my hotel room, meet this guy in the lobby. By this time, I understand he is the chief of staff to the mayor. The mayor is one of 17 members of the Central Committee. And so he hands me back my passport. And in it, I am now a citizen of the country of Vietnam for the next five years. So you might ask, well, what did you say to him, right? So let me walk through this just so you can start to think about the fact that the big thing I said to him to begin with was I said, hey, you guys are sitting here debating whether or not you want to be a cheaper programming site than India. And I said, why are you going to build someone else's future when you could build your own? And I said, well, let me give you some examples. I said, uh, let, let me start with the fact that you are one of the largest exporters of shrimp in the world. It is fairly obvious that the next step in shrimp manufacturing is branded shrimp. How would you brand shrimp? Well, you'd brand it by quality control. How would you do that? Well, you'd measure the quality of the water. You'd be instrumenting the machines that clean the shrimp, right? A totally digital business, which would allow you to create higher quality shrimp that you could sell at a higher price. Number two, uh, turns out Vietnam's one of the largest textile manufacturers in the world. Actually, uh, the Chinese have moved textile manufacturing out of China into Vietnam because it's lower labor rate. And I told him, I said, well, I bet you anything that if I walk in to those textile manufacturing sites, that those machines there making textiles were not manufactured in Vietnam. And I said, look, at this point in time, you guys know way more about textiles than anybody else in the world. Why would you not build a next generation textile manufacturing machine, which was totally digital, connected, right? That could allow you to build custom fabrics of any kind. And by the way, not only would that improve the productivity of your own textile uh, industry, but you could export that worldwide. And the last point I made to him is I said, let's talk a little about healthcare. Said, so, uh, you know, healthcare is is sits at the core of any country. And at the end of the day, can you replicate a quote first world healthcare system? Some of us would debate whether you want to do that, but can you build enough hospitals? Can you build enough medical schools to do it the old fashioned way? And I said, well, why would you do it the old fashioned way, right? If you look at what it looks like today, we build buildings to put machines in like gene sequencers and ultrasounds and all that. And then we put our smart humans in the building who are only accessible if you come to the building. And I said, you know, we figured this out in my business technology a long time ago. You could put the computers away from the humans. You could create networks. And I said, and oh, by the way, you you could put those gene sequencers in central Vietnam and you actually have the political muscle to gene sequence every human being in Vietnam. So I'm going to end by saying to you guys, I'm going to give you five big challenges that I want you to think about in Guatemala. I'm going to start by saying, number one, build your own future. I mean, it's great to learn things about what we're doing in the States and whatnot, but it's not the same. And I'll just give you a simple example of this. If you look at what has happened in China, on the one hand, yes, they kind of closed things down, said, I don't want you American companies here for a whole variety of reasons. But the other part is, if you look at China, the way it looks, it's these massive populations sitting in highly dense city centers. 
So, which never, by the way, built landlines. It was totally mobile from day one. So the technologies that evolved there in how mobile payments works, how how you get food, how you order a ca- everything has evolved actually quite differently than what happened in the U.S. because of the way they live and because their computer has always been the cell phone. It's never been some laptop or something else. So number one, build your own future. You have your own challenges, build your own future. Number two, build it with software. I try to help people understand that software is an amazing thing. Its cost to create is zero. It is literally your imagination. And and so its cost to create is zero. Its cost to deploy, meaning to activate it, is nearly zero. At this stage in cloud computing, I can get a computer to run for an hour in a managed environment for two and a half cents. So its cost to deliver is near zero. So building a future based on software is building a future based on innovation, your brain, and a, in essence, no cost structure versus, oh, I'm going to use bricks and steel, et cetera, to go build my future. The third thing I'm going to say is, and I did give you a lot of examples out of digital banking, but if you really start to think about it, at the end of the day, nothing happens without flow of money, flow of cash. There can be no commerce. And, and we, the, the technologies all exist today to do this. I already told you about a little African country called Kenya, which pulled it off many years ago. I would really tell you, start thinking about how you move to digital banking, digital currencies, et cetera, to improve access to capital, to improve flow of capital, et cetera. So that's a third thing. The fourth is education. I commented on literacy rates. I'm talking at a, at a, at a university event. Uh, education, we all know, is like core and key to any next step in any society, in any country. And, and I would just say, start thinking about it differently. Why do we do education as we put a bunch of smart people in a building and we make it accessible to only a few people. And by the way, that's true in the United States. That's how we think about it. We put our smart people, you know, our lecturers like Monica, et cetera, in a building and we say, well, only, you know, a thousand of you can come here and listen to her. Why do we do that? With the technologies we have, with the abilities that we have, why do we not shift how we educate everybody from the youngest to the oldest and in and make it possible to be able to build your own future. And the last, and you know, it's probably because I've been spending, as you heard, time in a very ambitious project to connect all million healthcare machines and all the children's hospitals in the world and build a digital infrastructure that can completely transform children's healthcare. I'd say get on the path to thinking about healthcare in a digital era. Again, why do we put smart people in a building accessible to a few people as the fundamental idea of how we deliver health care? If we start to rethink this, right, our populations, by the way, including the United States, needs to rethink this. Because at the end of the day, if your population is not healthy, is, is not educated, I mean, what future is there? And so hopefully I'm, I've left you with a couple of challenges touched on a few things that I want you to go get smarter about, cloud computing, the internet of things, AI, 5G, and edge computing, and encourage you to, I said, build your own future. And I hope that the things that the the university, Monica, et cetera, I love the motto she told us about it the other day, allows more and more and more people to take advantage of a education that could change their lives. So thank you all.